Swim check one, two. Bike check one, two. Run check one, two. I think we're ready. Let's try this. Welcome to the Try Beginner's Luck podcast, a podcast where we explore the sport of triathlon from a variety of perspectives to help beginner triathletes on their journey. I am your host, Nashonda Shines. Welcome to another edition of Try Beginner's Luck. You've got it. I am going to say I am so thrilled today. As always, it is an honor and a joy to just be able to do something that I love, and that's to share stories and help you, yes, you, whoever you are, to help you on your journey, to try your journey. That's what this podcast is about. Today, I have been waiting for this moment for a long time, y'all. We are in season two, and I am beyond grateful to have this beautiful young lady with me today. Let me just give you a little bit about her before I introduce who she is. She's an accountant turned queen of triathlon. You heard that right. She's from Waukesha, Wisconsin. She resides in Oregon. She went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She is a mom. Mm -hmm. She's a wife. And she has an Olympic gold medal. What? Yes, she does. I get the pleasure of talking to Miss Gwen Jurgensen today. Gwen, how are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. Oh, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I know when you first joined the call, this is before we really started going live. I was just like, oh my gosh, it's finally happening. I'm so excited. <laughs> During season one, your schedule was so packed and I loved it because I got to you know, watch your journey on social media and just seeing you go hard after your goals and seeing you run those tempo runs, those sprints, those track workouts. I was like, she is doing it. Yes, yes, and yes. And doing some trials and the, the races and the events that you were doing. It was just so exciting to watch you. What is really going on in your world? What's life like in 2022? Yeah, so I, um, in 2022, changed uh, coaches to a new coach. Bobby McGee is my coach now in Boulder, Colorado. And, um, you know, kind of had a big move with the family to Boulder from Portland. And something I think my son... Uh, you know, I, I keep teasing that it's been his only adversity in his life, but he, whenever something goes wrong, he's like, I want to go back to Portland. So we've had to kind of overcome that as a family, but yeah, we made this big move to Boulder, um, which is been wonderful, um, you know, training hard and, you know, yeah, I have a son, but my husband and I also want more children. So we're actually looking into um, freezing some embryos so that, you know, I'm 35 years old and I'd like to have more kids, but um, you don't know how long those eggs will, will be, uh, uh, able to be fertilized. So, um, yeah, we're looking into that as well right now. Wow. So I feel kind of bad cause I thought you were still in Portland, but you know, that's what these things are all about. Right. So I'm so excited about your move. It's like new year, new beginnings, fresh coach, new coach, new start. This is good. And come on with freezing those eggs because we definitely want to see more babies running around. <laughs> yes. More babies. Speaking of more babies, this is Women's History Month. And I know I haven't um, really kind of, we haven't really gotten into the things that of the conversation just yet, but moms are important. Women are important to the sport and women are women before they're moms. <laughs> so I'm going to just jump right in it because I know you are passionate about DE. IA issues, which is diversity, equity, inclusion, and access issues. And one of the issues, because we're in Women's History Month, is women having being equitable in the sport. Women are mothers and women are incubators, which means if more moms are involved in this sport, that means more babies and youth will be involved in this sport, which means this sport could grow right? Tell me, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I think, 
it's hard, right? You know, I, I just think about my personal situation and how if roles were, were, were reversed, um, and you know, my husband could have babies, we'd have more babies by now, but because of the career I'm in and because of athletics, I've had to take a little break. And that's why we are, um, you know, freezing eggs and making sure that we have options going forward. But, you know, I think for me, I went to the 2016 Olympics, one gold and, I knew I wanted a family. And at that time, bef before the Olympics, I thought, well, there's no way I can be a mom and an athlete. And I saw some other moms out there at the Olympics in 2016. And I thought, you know what, there are some women that can do this and we can do this. And I think it takes a lot of support. I've had a very supportive husband um, throughout this process to be able to be a working mom. And like you said, I think, you know, the, the women are the, the ones who you know, we have the child and we can introduce them into sport. And if it's inclusive for us, we can make it inclusive for our, our children as well. I could not agree more. I think one of the key things that you said was support. And if there's a mom out there who has had this vision of doing something crazy, like doing a triathlon, but has been scared, you know, I just encourage you Perhaps look for other moms who are trying to find out what they do, how they do it, because this is an opportunity for you to try as well and to try your luck at doing triathlons with your family. What I've noticed is as I'm announcing races and I see moms and their children supporting them or holding up those banners, those kids are looking and seeds are being planted, which means they're going to be like, hey, I want to be like mom when I grow up or if it's their dad. I want to be like dad when I grow up. One of the key things you said was support. You have a supportive husband. Yes, I do. He's very supportive. And I think, you know, as well, something you said was, you know, the children, our children seeing us do something. And something that I noticed is my son, Stanley, he loves to do everything I do. And um, he wants to mimic me. And he's at that age, you know, it won't stay like that forever, but he's at that age when he really just wants to be involved, see what we're doing. And I don't really even push sports that much on him, but he just wants to do it. And I'm pretty sure he wants to do it because he just sees me do it every single day. And, um, you know, he's someone who he now is really into biking. And so a lot of times I'll run with him to school while he rides his bike. And I think it's all about just finding what works for both you and your child and, and finding that middle ground and making it work. You know, he's four years old, but he can sometimes drop me on the bike when I'm running. So I think it's like a good balance. And there's always a way to, to make that work and get your children involved in, in whatever you're doing. I love the fact that as he's riding his bike to school, you're running. So then who has to take the bike back home? Is that you too? <laughs> so uh, normally we just lock it up. Um, or sometimes if my husband rides as well, he'll carry the bike home while he's riding his bike home, which is just insane, I think. <laughs> wow, that is totally cool that you guys ride the bike. So that means you kind of stay very close to the school or how you, you're, you're training his legs early now. So. Um, what does that look like in the morning? Is he grumpy in the morning or is he like a pleasant child? It's like, yeah, let's go. Uh, when we're or, going to school and he gets to ride his bike, he is thrilled. And if I ever pick him up from school and have the car, oh, he's mad. He, he has this, it's so cute at the end of the day in their uh, preschool, they have this little circle where they all say something they're grateful for. Mm -hmm. And Stanley's thing almost every single day is I am grateful I get to ride my bike to school. So he absolutely loves it. Um, you know, I actually thought it was torture for a little bit. We were living, it was six kilometers. So, um, you know, quite a bit away from school for a four-year-old. And he would, he would be so mad if I said, you can't ride your bike to school. And I felt like it was torture because I'm like, no four-year-old should be doing 30 minutes of cardio, but he just loves it. I wonder if he has some of dad's genes because, you know, dad was a pro cyclist. Yes. And um, dad definitely um, brought him to the bike park a lot early. And our son actually didn't have much interest in riding his bike for a really long time. He just wanted to run. But yeah, this year he's really picked up biking. Okay. So, of course, everyone who's listening probably has heard your story or may not. 
let's talk about how you got into triathlons because I think it's a great story. So tell us about that. Yeah, so I grew up swimming and a little bit of running in high school. And I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I swam D1 and ran cross country and track. And I got recruited into the sport of triathlon. So USA Triathlon called me and said, on paper, you're good enough to go to the Olympics and we think you should do triathlon. And I just laughed at them. You know, I'd grown up with this dream of going to the Olympics, but it was, I felt like it was something that wasn't possible because of just how I had been in swimming. Like I had never made junior nationals, never made nationals. And so I just kind of laughed at him and said, there's no way I can do that. You know, I have a full-time job as an accountant. I'm studying for my CPA license. And it was Barb Lindquist who kept calling me. And I am so thankful she did. She became such a great mentor towards me. And she didn't push it, but she'd call me once a week and just say, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? And, you know, eventually I I said, okay, I'll try triathlon. And, um, I gave it a shot and I'm so thankful I did. Wow. So you were recruited while you were already out of college. But I guess if, and I I might've missed this part, but how did they even know you were doing triathlons? So I wasn't doing triathlons. Um, They recruit uh, USA Triathlon has a college recruitment program where they go and they look at college athletes who have, um, who are runners with a swimming background or swimmers with a running background. And because I swam and ran D1, I was kind of this perfect candidate for triathlon. See, now that's something I don't think, well, I know I didn't know, but who knew? So it's pretty, so yeah, cool. it's pretty cool. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of successful triathletes who've come out of that program. Um, Katie's Furious has come out of that program as well, who was, um, you know, multiple Olympian. And the program is great, I think, because you do like, you know, swimming is something, especially in the ITU world, you need to be a really, really good swimmer, which ITU is the triathlons I did and they're um, draft legal. So um, on the bike, it's really important that you get out in that front pack of the swim so that you can be with the cyclists um, and draft on the bike. And so there, this USA triathlon um, recruitment program is all about finding good swimmers. Um, and, you know, they, they figure we can teach anyone to bike, you know, biking is really just, it's not a very technique based thing. You just need to put in the miles on the bike, you know, you're strapped in, hooked in one spot. And, um, so you can kind of train that if you've got the engine and, um, so yeah, that's kind of how they do it. Wow. Okay. So my brain is like going in circles for many people, swimming is the barrier. However, yes, what I just heard you say is that the bike is relatively easy once you train the engine. And that can be a misnomer. And I probably said this on the podcast in previous times that the bike is the longest part of the, the race. And so that's the most important. But what I believe I'm hearing you say is if they want to take it to the next level, the swim is the most critical. Is that right? Yeah, especially for ITU, the swim is the most critical. And I, I really do think for the bike, it's, yeah, it's just training. It's just time in the saddle. It's, and that's, that's the way to get better on the bike. And, and swimming, you know, it's, as you know, is very technique based and you have to, you know, have a coach there and, and helping you and, um, and something that I, I think, swimming is not impossible to learn at an older age, but it's more difficult than, than the bike and the bike. You're right. It's the longest portion. And the way to make the most gains is to train on the bike. And I believe that's, um, pretty simple. It's just time. Wow. So a little bit of backstory. I met Gwen initially because she did, a, she did a talk for district triathlon, maybe about two or three years ago. And she was just like saying, hey, I am here for issues. I want to see more athletes of color, you know, to bridge that gap of, you know, access, diversity. And so that's how we initially started chatting. What I am so pleased to let you know is that I recently just completed a quote unquote swim clinic where my stroke, even though I was a swimmer when I was younger, was deconstructed by a coach Lloyd with On Point Fitness. And he's taken a group of us 
and saying, hey, I want you guys not to just be swimmers, but to be great swimmers with the right technique. Because if you have the right technique, then you're going to be able to not expel as much energy. And for me to hear you say that, I'm actually kind of feeling pretty good about things. Yeah, and just to you're let doing people, awesome. Right. And just to let people know, like, even if those who have was swimmers when they were growing up, it doesn't matter. If you're swimming while you're an adult, you're probably in a better time to learn because you get to learn the right way and not bring in bad habits from your youth. Cause you know, when you're young, you pick up sloppy habits. And so for those of you who are like, swimming is not my strong suit. I encourage you to get with a coach or get with a swim instructor that can show you the right technique so that you're swimming totally emerged in a very clean, succinct way, because that's going to help your open water swimming. If you choose to do open water triathlons. That Great. is so true. A hundred percent. I love that. And I do think, you know, it is, it's something as an adult, if you want to learn it, you can, right. And as a child, like you said, you just kind of like do it, maybe to do it. You don't necessarily understand. And when you're an adult, you can understand, no, like this technique, uh, you know, I think it's also important to know when you're learning swimming that technique comes first and the times will come later. So don't expect your technique to, even if your technique is perfect today, your times aren't going to be there today. You need to practice that perfect technique and um, it can take time, but the benefits are huge if you give it that time. I'm stuck because I want to repeat that and I can't. So I'm going to have to re-listen to this myself. So y'all, that was a whole nugget. I just need you to know, take note of that nugget because that's good because we get so caught up in time and speed and being fast and in swimming, you're right. I feel like I'm a little slower now because I'm doing it the correct way versus doing it the wrong way. And I, it's easier it's surprisingly yes. easier to swim the right way. <laughs> oh, drop my pen because my God. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm dropping it. No. Wow. Okay. That's so good. I don't want to spend all of our time on swimming, but it is important because people yes. are scared of the water. And so the more comfortable you feel in the water, the better you'll be and the better you will feel as you transition to the bike. So let's go to the bike. The bike was something that you needed to learn how to do. How hard was it for you when you initially got on the bike to learn it? And what was your, I guess, what's the word I want to use? What was your learning curve? Ooh, um, yeah, you know, I, I guess it was really maybe humbling, I guess you could say at the beginning, you know, I'm uh, learning to ride a bike with clipless pedals. So I'm clipped in and I know I stop signs constantly, don't know how to unclip, um, super scared on the bike. To this day, I'm still nervous on the bike. I blame my mother for giving me that gene of uh, just being scared of things. <laughs> she, she instilled it in me in a very young age, but maybe that's why I'm alive. Who knows? Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I, the, the cycling for me, it, it was, it took a while to learn, you know, I had I'd never ridden a road bike like that before. And, um, you know, I started to immerse myself in different types of cycling, which I felt really helped me. I did some mountain biking, some cycle cross, some track cycling. And, and those were the sorts of things that helped me get more comfortable on the bike. But, but the reality is like, even to this day, when I go out for a bike ride, I'm, I'm nervous. Um, cars go fast. I'm nervous about descents. And, and for me, I, I really had to work mentally on reminding myself some things that really helped me is if I was ever riding with somebody, I knew that if the person in front of me could make that turn or make that descent, I could too. And, and so, you know, I used little tricks like that to kind of trick my mind and, and remind myself of, um, you know, how, technique can help me and, and how it actually is safe if you know how to ride a bike. Okay. Gwen, you're coming with these nuggets, girlfriend. You're making me put on my glasses so I can see better. <laughs> so you said a mouthful again. Last year, I had some friends who started doing cyclocross who are triathletes. And I went to my first cyclocross and was 
the energy intensity one I don't know if I have it in me to do it because I'm clumsy and so to hop (laughs) off a bike and to try to hop back on and fall on my face is probably not ideal for me (laughs) however I think that is really cool like the mountain biking the cyclocross the track to to get bike handling skills because ultimately and this is a what I hear when talking to people who are cyclists, cyclists and triathlon riders who are cyclists, people who are road cyclists really dislike triathlon cyclists because they don't know road skills and they don't know how to handle. They don't, they turn wide. I was riding with a friend right before a race, uh, just kind of doing a shakeout ride and he was judging my riding skills. And I was like, And he's only two days from learning how to, you know, he's doing crit and uh, I'm calling him out. His name is Mike Ship. And so he just started doing crits and he's like, oh, I see what they're talking about now. Cause he was riding with me and I was making these wide turns and he's like, your bike handling skills are horrible. So how did you get comfortable doing cyclocross and mountain biking? Because that's some, for you to be worried and scared, I don't understand that correlation because I would... Tell me about it. Yeah. Um, my very first cycle cross race, my husband brought it. He was my fiance or boyfriend at the time, but he brought me to it. And I remember at the time I had this really big fear of left hand downhill turns. I don't know why, but I swear we went to this course and it was somehow magically, it was all left hand downhill somehow, all the turns. And we did like a pre-course ride. And I said, I can't do this Patrick. Like I just can't. And he said, well, you're a runner, just pick up your bike and run every single lap. And I just looked at him and I was like, basically in tears, just so mad at him. And I was like, fine, whatever, I'll run the entire thing. And so, you know, it was however many laps, but the first one, like I literally ran 90% of it. Then the second lap, I kind of ran only 80%. And it was just like each lap, I noticed I was riding a little bit more and a little bit more. And I just had to kind of go into it and, you know, put know that I would be the worst there and just put my head down and, and view it as this learning experience. And, you know, the, the nice thing about cycle cross and mountain biking, at least for me, is you're going a lot slower. Usually there's grass and dirt. So if you do make a tumble, it's usually not the end of the world. And that's something that felt like a safe place for me to learn. And something that I also did in in learning new skills on the bike was I always knew what my comfort zone was. Um, and, you know, I'd push it outside of the comfort zone. If it got to be too much and, you know, I was on the, a breakdown and I was going to start crying I'd say, you know what, I'm just going to go back to my comfort zone for five minutes and I'm going to go back, you know, if it's like, whatever, maybe it's, you know, making a turn that's 90 degrees. Okay. I know I can do that. I'm just going to go back and do that for five minutes to regain my confidence, kind of recompose myself. And then I'm going to go back to this challenge of a bunny hop or whatever it is that I was trying to do. So given where you are in your career right now, would you still go back to cyclocross and mountain biking once you reach your goals? Maybe if my son begged me to, (laughs) um, (laughs) I do. I think, I think cyclocross is really fun. Mountain biking. I probably, I I don't think I'd ever race mountain biking. That's something that, um, is a little bit too, Mm, too many rocks for me, too many rocks, too many scary downhills. Um, but you know, it's something that, you know, my son right now is really into to biking and he likes to go to the bike park and he likes to go on the skate park part, which terrifies me because it's cement and it's all these jumps. And it's just like, I have a hard time because I, all I see is him falling in my head, but he does great. And he just loves it. He'll like ride by me every time. And he is, his goal is to make me scared, which probably is not a good goal, but yeah, I think, you know, that, you know, like you said earlier, like it's as a, as a mom, I feel like I need to be inclusive and I try not to be scared for him because I want him to do sports and I want him to be in this endurance space. And I think it's a great, you know, there's not many lifelong sports that you can do, you know, you don't really see people at, 50, 60 playing basketball and trying to best themselves. But you do see that in triathlon and swimming and or triathlon, running, biking. And so I do want to encourage that with my son. So if he asked me to, I probably would. I love it. I absolutely love it. And I think that will hopefully encourage other moms to not be scared for their children. Because I mean, let's just get it. My mom fusses at me. She's like, you just don't know because you're not a mom yet. And I just be like, side eyeing her like, chick, relax. (laughs) However, 
I, she's kind of right. However, moms, if you do it, then you won't be scared for your child because you've experienced yes. it. And so it's an opportunity for you to get out there and try it, <laughs> try beginner's luck and make it happen. And I think that will help to alleviate the fears, but fear is definitely crippling. And we all succumb to fear at some point, but the more that we don't, we learn, like if we gave it our, if we tried it and we liked it, it's like, wow, we did. And if we tried it and we didn't like it, at least we can say we tried it. So yeah. I just encourage that's you. And I love that. I do think that's great for moms to just, yeah, go out there and try it. And it does, it gives you a safe space because you know what it is and you know how to handle it. And you, know, you also take precautions. You wear a helmet. Like you, you do things that as well, you know, make it a safer space. I love it. You mentioned getting out of your comfort zone or going to your comfort zone for a moment uh, and running the course on the cyclocross. And so I want to use this moment to transition now into running because that's your comfort. Um, well, in 2017, you announced that you were getting out or giving up your comfort zone of being in triathlons to pursue a big new goal. And that's to win the gold medal in marathon. Let's talk about that because running is one of your strengths. However, triathlon became the indirect way for you to get to the Olympics and win gold. So now that you're going back to your first love, how is it when you first started running in triathlon and managing coming from the bike to the run and making that transition when you were running? We'll talk about that first. Yeah. Um, well, I guess just talking about my transition to running has been not great. Um, you know, I, I wanted to try to qualify for the Olympics in the marathon, and I didn't even make it to the start line of the marathon trials. Instead, I was at the track trials. I had um, an injury. Uh, it was a tendon injury, and I had to have surgery. And, you know, I have my running career has not been great. And I think when people think of my triathlon career, they think of basically I, I was unbeatable and that, but that's not the case either. And, you know, a lot of these moments in running where I have races that don't go well, I'm reminded of how much struggles and, and how hard it was in triathlon as well. Um, but, you know, for me, running is something that, you know, I think I want to talk about a little bit too, like just having goals. And I think as a female, a lot of times we're looked down on if we project these big goals and I'm someone who's not afraid to say what I want and what I'm going after. I think it holds not only myself accountable, but my team, my coach, um, the people who I'm working with. And I think it's also important to know that you can make adjustments along the way. You know, when I got an injury and couldn't go to the, the trials in, in 2020, or I guess, it, yeah, in 2020 for the marathon, I you know, had to adjust that goal and that's okay. I think that's part of the learning experience and it's great to have these big goals that you shoot after, but have little goals along the way and make sure that there's process-based goals and things and don't be afraid to, to change that big goal. Wow. Don't be afraid to change the big goal. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Because oftentimes when we, it's the appearance of failing because we didn't make the goal from a woman's perspective, because we are projected to be more emotional or just more in tune with our emotions and we express them a little differently and perhaps better. It can be seen as really a downcast. I recently had a, in 20, well, in 2021, I went after my first Ironman and I literally prepared, every, I was probably overly prepared for the race. And the one thing I couldn't control was the one thing that was the demise of my race ultimately. And the thing is, it was the one thing that could affect people in different aspects. And that's jellyfish stings. Oof, yeah. And not knowing the severity of the toxins of the jellyfish and what they can do to your body and ultimately cause death if you don't if depending on how your body reacts to it and I almost felt like I was dying there but just having a liquid diet I knew it wasn't my nutrition and I didn't pinpoint everything until after the race but my I it, it, I, and I ultimately realized that the jellyfish things caused me to have GI issues which meant meant I literally was stopping almost every mile of the run to use the bathroom 
Yeah, that's rough. Oof, duh. And I finished, but didn't technically wow. finish according to the standards of yep. you didn't the organization. Yeah, you didn't make the cutoff time. Yep. Right. Yep. So I crossed the finish line just a little bit after things. So I, I called it a fought. I fought differently, finished over time, but I finished I it all in race, right? Aww. So, but for a while last year, I was disappointed and literally was beating myself up because I was trying to go after and do the Florida race and had started running and still training. And one day I sat down and was like, I could not even think about going for a run. And I knew at that point I was finished and I was done and realized I was operating more so out of pride. So what would you say to a woman or to any of those that are listening to us? We're just in Women's History Month. That's why I'm like talking about women specifically. But what would you say to anyone who's come after a goal? Because this is the beginning of tri season for some people. They don't hit that goal. How do you suggest that they transition well from a mental perspective and still continue to fought, fight differently? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, you said something like you were doing it out of pride and I think a lot of times we want to do that, but if we're going to be successful, we have to do it out of the joy for it and the joy of it. And, you know, we, we all have disappointing races. We all have times when we, we don't meet our goals. It can be not even in a triathlon. It can be in work. And it's frustrating. And, you know, I personally let myself have 24 to 48 hours where I can be as mad and sad and as upset as I want. Cause like you said, emotions are good and it's good to let that out. You can't let that be bottled up and, you know, let yourself be heard. And, um, you know, a lot of times within that portion, right after the race were irrational. And it's not even because of how the race went. It's just because you've pushed your body to the limit and your body is just tired. And so you just, you, sometimes you can't even see things clearly. And for me before every race and after every race, I talk about, I always, no matter if it was a complete failure or not, I come up with things that I did well. And these are things that are always process based. So like technique and you know like did I keep my elbow up on the swim did I you know drink my nutrition when I said I was going to things that you know you can accomplish and it doesn't matter what the outcome is like you said in your race you you did everything right and there was something that wasn't controllable that caused the outcome and that happens all the time in life and in races like more than 50 percent of the time I'd say you have something that you can't control that's going to impact your outcome which is why it's so important to look at the process and the technique that you use to to get there because that's the thing that needs to keep you going you know that if you're doing the process correct that eventually you will get that outcome that you've trained and worked so hard for I couldn't agree more. And like today, this internet issue, I can't control it. And I'm the only person on the internet and it's still talking about some internet unstable with full bars because they're hating, the internet is hating on our conversation and I'm not here for it. Ugh. The things that we can't control, but we oh, have to I'm sad. I hope it's not, flow. I think, yeah. Ugh. No. I hope it, it's I, not mine. Mine says it's good too. I know it's, it's, it's mine. Mine is a hater and that's okay. We're going to be <laughs> okay. Let's move to this. You, um, you're, you've had this uncomfortable transition into running. What are you setting goals for yourself this year for running? And before we go there, I want to go back to address for those of you who are beginners. I think it's important to know if you're starting out, if you race long enough, you will have an uncomfortable race that doesn't go well. And I think it's important to know that failing or perceiving or did not finish, or you know, you, you didn't have the race you wanted or desired for, that doesn't equate to a failure. Process it, give yourself the time and move forward. But just know that if you race long enough, you will come to a point where you do have a race. You may not have it the first two or three seasons. It may come the fourth or fifth season, but you will have a race that won't be desirable. But don't just quit. Keep trying because you never know where it could end up for you. And it could be like a Gwen situation. USAT could be watching your times and say, hey, wait a minute. This person is absolutely phenomenal. I think we should reach out to them because who's to say that you can't go pro at 35 or at 40. It can happen as long as you have the physical aptitude. 
So that's all I have to say. So great yes. if you remember I my think, question. Yeah, I mean, well, we do. I just want to touch on you. We do all have bad races. And I always think back to, you know, what would I tell my son or what would I tell a child who's, um, you know, maybe going through puberty or something. And, you know, because when you're young, a lot of times you do have a race that's better, 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 best. Um, and then a lot of times you go through puberty or, you know, you just hit that point where um, you finally learned enough. And so not every race is getting better. And, and what would you tell a child in that situation when they have a bad race? Would you say, oh, just give up and quit because you had a bad race? You would never say that. Like no one would ever say that. And so I think we need to, a lot of times treat ourselves like we would treat others. And um, yeah, you're going to have bad races, but that doesn't mean it's a failure. It doesn't mean your journey is a failure. Uh, it just means you haven't reached the end yet. Yes, that is good. And what you said is to think about what you would tell your children, or if you don't have children, what would you tell, tell a child, you know? And if we think about that, if we approach the situation as children, again, for the joy of it, we'll yes. be all right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, um, that's kind of hard. I don't even know where to transition from here because this has been such a fruitful conversation. What would be one of the things that you remember when you were beginning that you wish you would have known back then? Oof. Um, so there's quite a few things I've learned throughout my career. And I think one of the biggest ones is to view things as a sacrifice, not an, or to view things as an investment, not a sacrifice. So I used to say like, oh, you know, I, I can't go to the movies. This is such a big sacrifice. Or I had to move abroad for nine months of the year for travel. And I was like, that's too big of a sacrifice. And one of my coaches, Jamie Turner said, well, is it a sacrifice or is it an investment in yourself? And that was really mind shift, a huge mind shift for me. And now like everything I do, I think about it as that, like, is this an investment I'm making in myself that will pay dividends going forward? Um, and then focusing on the process, not the outcome, which we've kind of talked about before having those process based goals that's something that's huge. And then as well, and this one's really hard for people, I think, but not caring what anyone else thinks. Um, and, you know, part of that is what we talked about, you know, doing it for the joy of it, but, you know, right now with social media and, you know, everyone, you know, like probably after your race, you know, everyone's like, how did it go? What'd you do? What was your time? Like, people always want to those questions and we need to just accept that we did our best and and don't project thinking people are judging you and and only focus on yourself and and you know have a tight circle that you rely on but um don't don't fixate on what you think other people are thinking Gwen I'm just gonna give you an offering because that was so good <laughs> don't get fixated on what people think. And you got to be mindful of the social media, the instant wanting to know the instant gratification and being caught up in what other people are posting like metal Mondays and, oh my God, I had the best race of my life and yes. all that kind of good stuff. And then you're comparing yourself to that and falling into to that comparison trap. Listen, it is not worth it. It's not worth the mental, uh, the mental, what is it called? The mental gymnastics it will do on your brain and your mind. Like, it's just not worth it, y'all. Like, we are here to do this for the fun of it. We are adults. Most of us are adults doing this for the fun. You are paying yes. to go through all this suffering. <laughs> Have fun with it, okay? Have fun. Yes. It's the least we can do is have fun. So with that said, we have talked about so much. And I love that you are telling beginners to think about it as an investment versus a sacrifice. Because for me, that just shifted my whole paradigm as I think about, like, it's an investment for me, for my body, for my health yes. and making sure that, you know, when I do have children, I can be healthy for them. And, you know, and it's a, it's three disciplines. So it gives an opportunity for your body to have a rest at certain points. So this has been so, so, so good. So this season, I started doing something new where I get an opportunity to just brag on who I am talking about. And I am going to brag on you before we get into our rapid fire, because we are coming a little bit close to our end. And I want to keep it all in, you know, keep it so that people will want to keep listening to me and listening to the <laughs> podcast. So Gwen Jorgensen, if you don't know, now you are about to know who she is. Yes, she started swimming at an early age. Yes, she went to a D1 school and swam and ran. Yes, she also played basketball. 
She loved, loved, loved making new friends. She earned a master's degree in accounting, y'all, and was on her way to be a CPA before there was a major shift thanks to USA Triathlon, our governing body who saw her talent and skills to become a great triathlon lead in this area. And who knew that Gwen always wanted to be an Olympian, just not as a triathlete. But ultimately, there was someone who did know, who has a bigger, higher power than we do, that you would be a two-time Olympian, a world champion, and winning the gold in Rio. You are a mom who's so amazing to Stanley, a CPA who can still work on those finances, girl, come holla at me, and currently training for your trials in track and field. And I just want to wish you all the luck. And with your attitude, Gwen, I see why you are a champion. Your mindset is a champion mindset. And I thank you for dropping gems with my audience today. So thank you so much. Now we get to move on to the fun stuff. Oh boy, rapid fire. <laughs> rapid fire. So you already know what it's about. Give me quick, fun answers. I ask a lot of, you know, I asked some of these in season one and I just feel like they're just good questions and it gives people an opportunity to know you in a different way and, and see you in a different light. Perfect. All right. What's your favorite thing about training in general? How I feel when I'm done. I'm always, you know, I think a lot of times it's draining to train people think, but for me, every time I'm done training, I just feel energized and like I'm ready for the day. That's so cool. Your husband is a chef. So these next couple of questions are going to be really fun. And if you, it's going to be really fun. So what is your favorite meal that you like to come home to that your husband cooks? Oh boy. He does this like, um, butternut squash pasta. So it's pasta, but then the sauce is like this butternut squash with nutritional yeast and nuts. And it's just, it's phenomenal. It's, it's amazing. It's vegan, but you know, I'm not vegan, but it is like the best. I'm doing a body roll. You got to tell Patrick to send me that recipe because yes. I love me some butternut squash. <laughs> I, oh my gosh. I love butternut squash. Okay. See, I'm getting all caught up in these questions. Okay. And cool. who doesn't love carb on carb, right? You got the butternut squash pasta, like sauce on the carb pasta. It's good. Yes. Who, Patrick, I may be expecting that recipe, Gwen. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite post-workout meal? I am always craving stuff that's super salty post-workout because in the workout, a lot of times I'm having, you know, goos and, um, uh, like scratch super fuel and, and stuff that's very sugary. So after a workout, anything that just is loaded up with salt. Um, a lot of times Patrick makes me a little to go meal that I can eat, um, in the car right after the workout. And normally it's just like a simple stir fry with, um, eggs and veggies and rice and just a lot of liquid amino, which is basically soy sauce. Mm, which brings in that salty. Yes. <laughs> Okay. So what is your favorite, say championship meal? Like when you finish a race, what do you like to eat after that? Normally just like a hamburger and fries, I feel, or it depends on if I'm in like a, wherever I am, I kind of want like whatever's local. So, you know, if I'm in Philly, I want a Philly cheesesteak or if I'm in, you know, like Japan, I want sushi. Um, so, you know, normally pre-race, we actually bring a rice cooker to most races and cook everything pre-race in the hotel room. So afterwards, I kind of always want to find whatever the best restaurant restaurant is. I love that. Uh, in season one, CK Henry also said that her favorite post meal is, uh, or she likes a good hamburger and fries. So yes, Sika it's salty, it's yum. Me, I've got the protein, you got everything you need. Everything you need. And it's good all American meal. Come on. Yes. <laughs> and then I love how you enter that international flair. Like if I'm in Japan, I'll get sushi. <laughs> Come on, you better do it, girl. Give us some international flavor. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. Let's get off the food for a little bit. Um, are you a transition minimalist back in the day when you were, you know, doing races? triathlons, are you a transition minimalist Goldilocks where everything had to be just right? Or were you a kitchen sink type of person where you just brought everything? In the actual transition area or just in races? <laughs> ah, 
I feel like this is a two part question. So for you, you can answer both parts. <laughs> I am somebody who definitely like two races brings everything and the kitchen sink. Like to the Olympics, I brought three bikes. They were all the exact same bike, but I brought three. I brought two wetsuits in Rio and it was like hot. I mean, like really hot, like no one would ever need a wetsuit. So definitely like bring everything, but um, definitely like for setting up transition and that sort of thing, it just has to be just exactly what I need. Just right. Goldilocks. Um, yeah. That is so good. Okay. So this is a little bit of music. I think people can get a bit about your personality, about your music that you listen to. And I love music. So who is your favorite artist? Um, probably Darius Rucker. Um, okay. so I really like like country or pop country. Um, yes. Yeah. I love pop country too. Okay. Who, what's your favorite song? Uh, well, probably Wagon Wheel by Darius Rucker because that um, it was actually our wedding song. Oh, okay, okay. I'm writing that down. You should listen All to right. it. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. The who or what inspires you? I get this question a lot, and I. I, it really is just the people around me. It's my husband, it's my parents, it's my son. I'm, I'm someone who's definitely inspired by the people who are in my life, encouraging me. And I see how much they do and how much, um, just how thankful I am for them. That's kind of what inspires me. I love, all right. Think back to your triathlon days. Have you ever done any long course triathlons? No. Okay. So this may or may not be applicable, but I'm just going to ask because okay, you might it. have yeah. an answer. Do you pee on the bike or get off the bike to pee? It's a great question. I'm not sure because I haven't been in that situation before. Okay. Um, I have though gone to the bathroom with a wetsuit on because it's too hard to take <laughs> off. <laughs> That works. Thank you so much. And my final question is above what has been your greatest accomplishment to date outside of winning the Olympic gold medal? Well, I think it is my greatest accomplishment, no matter what. And that's having my son, Stanley, Um, anyone who is a mom and has had a child knows that it's very, I guess everyone has a different birth um, a story and different process, but that was definitely one of the hardest yet most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. I absolutely love it. Gwen Jorgensen, thank you so much for just having fun with me today. I feel like you just brought all the gems and I really hope that my listeners and viewers really appreciate what you brought today because you did bring some really good lessons and just valuable gems that we can treasure forever. Thank you so much, Stanley. One day you will be able to see this and I cannot wait to see what you're going to accomplish in the cycling world or whatever it is that you desire, but I know that you are destined for greatness. So you have a great mommy and Mr. Patrick, you are a bomb husband for all that you do and sacrifice for your girl. So way to go. That should have been my greatest accomplishment was locking him (laughs) down. Hey, that's a good one. (laughs) Oh, okay. So Patrick, you're part of the greatest accomplishment too. There was your shout out. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. And guys, listen, you heard it here in different ways. Get out there and try. This podcast is here to help you try to get you from moving from curious to being that weekend warrior. We want you to try. We want you to get out there and give it your best. And remember, when you always try, you truly always win. No matter how it ends, you win. So this is Mashonda. I'm out. And until next episode, be great and always shine. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in and listening to this episode. We need your help so we can continue to try at TBL. So for more information on where you can find and subscribe to this podcast, visit www.trybeginnersluck.com. And don't forget, whenever you try beginner's luck, you always win.